Welcome. We are now live. Today is August 25th, 2020, and this is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. Um, we are also joined by a member of Appropriations, Representative Fagan. Thank you for joining us today. Our primary <coughs> focus this week will be a review of the governor's recommended budget related to education. That's pre-K-12 as well as post-secondary, and the Appropriations Committee has asked us to review these budgets and to get back to them next week, so no small task. Um, today's focus will be on post-secondary institutions. Tomorrow our focus will be on pre-K-12. Um, is Commissioner Gresham in yet? I don't see Commissioner Gresham quite yet. Um, okay, uh, they still might be in the governor's address today. Uh-huh, okay. Until so one o'clock. He's our, he's our first person, so, <laughs> but I do Here see that Loki's on, so we might, oh, there he is, he's, he's coming in. Okay, he's in. Is Representative Gresham in now? I am here. Excellent, thank you. So uh, welcome, Commissioner Gresham. We are happy to have you join us today. And we are gonna start with funding of the Vermont State College System and particularly the bridge funding. And we'll later follow, we will later hear from UVM as well as AVEC, the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges regarding to COVID relief funds. Um, and then we are also gonna hear two updates uh, from the two studies going forward. Uh, one is the Vermont Forward Task Force and uh, Representative Jean Batista serves on that. Um, we will hear from, from uh, the, the chancellor on that. And then we will also have an update on the select committee on the future of public higher education. And Joyce Manchester from JFO is, is, will be prepared to, to support us through that. And just a reminder that our own representative Kathleen James was appointed to that um, commission. So thank you for committee. So thanks for joining that. So um, I would like to welcome Commissioner Gresham um, to help us better understand that the governor's um, proposal on the Vermont State Colleges with a particular emphasis on the bridge funding. Right. So <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee for uh, giving me an audience. So I was going to work from the uh, document that I believe was circulated to you earlier today. It was a general fund overview. Is the committee, uh, does the committee have access to that document or? I can you... post it just a second. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. What I w was going to do, and, and I know that this is not the time for a full general fund overview, but I wanted to start there to give you an idea of kind of the financial situation we were sitting in. If you look at the document with the, the tables, the uh, three color tables that show you kind of the progression from January when the governor submitted his budget, um, which is FY21 GovRec in blue to June 8th when we were kind of at the uh, bottom uh, or kind of the full flower of the pandemic to the restatement, um, which is what we submitted last week, you kind of get a flow for revenue availability. The top line of this chart shows you what our current law revenue is. That's the what the emergency board accepts as consensus forecast. And you can see that in January of uh, 21, we were looking at uh, 1596, just shy of $1.6 billion of current law revenue. That now um, is at 1.413. Um, so, you know, we're down about $182 million in revenue, compensated somewhat by higher direct applications from some of our uh, enterprise funds and special funds. Notably, uh, we got a couple million more from liquor. I guess you guys are spending your spare time wisely, <laughs> as well as stuff like unclaimed property and um, from uh, financial regulation and the like. But, you know, the kind of the net of it is uh, a fairly steep decline in our available revenue. Um, the good news is, uh, thanks to the moves that this body and the administration made in um, May and June of uh, this spring, 
with a second budget adjustment, we were able to save a fair amount of general fund, which fell to the bottom line. We did that not because we wanted to money to fall to the bottom line. We did it because at the time, we didn't think we had um, the money to spend. So we uh, second budget adjustment saved us about $84 million. Um, and then um, happily and surprisingly in July, when people paid their uh, deferred taxes that were originally due in April, May, and June, uh, you'll remember the federal and the state government deferred those until July. Um, when people finally did pay their taxes to our surprise, pleasant surprise, not only did they pay what was forecasted they would pay, but they paid more. Um, so tax revenues came in really hot. So the net result of a, a second budget adjustment and higher tax revenues resulted in $130 million of surplus from fiscal 20. In addition, um, because we had uh, essentially shut down good parts of our government in the last quarter of fiscal 20, um, there was a fairly steep amount of carry forward funds. Carry forward funds are funds that are unused. If we appropriate a department $100 and they only use $75, they have $25 at the end of the year available for carry forward. Uh, every year that kind of typically will have somewhere between 15 to 25 million of carry forward. Uh, this year we had almost sixty million dollars. Um, in a just typical to year, the, just to clarify for the committee, that's carried forward from FY from FY uh, twenty. That's correct, and so we would carry that forward into FY twenty one. And typically, we allow departments to keep their carry forward funds. They're oftentimes appropriations that haven't been spent because maybe a bill is uh, late being sent out and thus paid. Um, you know, maybe uh, they've got certain uh, grants that haven't gone out yet, but they intend to send out in, say, July or August. So this is usually a good reason why departments haven't spent all of their appropriations, and it's good reasons to let them keep it. Uh, this year, again, in part because we, we closed down substantial parts of government, um, stuff like, for example, uh, travel budgets were, um, you know, saved. Um, that's not the kind of thing that they'll make up for in the new year. Um, that's typically, you know, you don't travel twice because you didn't travel in the spring. So, you know, that kind of money, um, you know, stuff like the state parks opening late so they didn't hire employees as, as uh, early normally do, that kind of money is basically saved. Um, so what we did was we reverted roughly half of what we had available through carry forward. Um, and that's another $28 million. That too is one time. Uh, that's not permanent, but we were able to put in about $158 million of one-time money to help us balance the books. Um, so our revenue situation, whereas it was quite compromised from what we started out with at the beginning of the year, turned out to be not quite as bad as we thought. Nonetheless, we were you know, operating in a fairly constrained environment. So you know, I just wanted to kind of lay out that um, framework and to get to kind of move to the state colleges um, so what the governor uh, in his general fund budget did was he provided for the normal operations of state government. Um, he provided for a few extras when um, he could find um, some available cash, mostly from one-time money that came in. Um, but he also allocated in this budget uh, about $152 million of coronavirus relief fund. That is money that um, is available in the fund um, and is, uh, has kind of passed muster in terms of what is uh, appropriate use based on guidance, what's appropriate use of the coronavirus relief fund. Um, so this budget included about $152 million of coronavirus relief fund allocation based on the fact that there's just slightly under $200 million that has yet to be allocated. So if you, page down to uh, the third page in that document, you'll see at the top it says CRF requests in general fund, tier one appropriations, $152 million. These are appropriations, again, that we put in the budget. You see the top line ACCD, $130 million, uh, $133 million. That is to continue, and in some cases, actually, I think, and I don't know if it created new grant programs, but I think it 
is to continue existing grant programs and add to them uh, when money is available. So uh, you see $133 million to go there. You see uh, a number of appropriations to human services, DCF reach up, Department of Corrections and the like down the list. These again are all appropriations that we know um, qualify for COVID money um, and you know, we believe are good uses of money. A lot of those appropriations as you look down the list are to uh, help fund government operations that are being substantially dedicated towards COVID relief. Um, in fact, virtually all of that uh, below the uh, ACCD line is to fund current operations where staff is dedicated to COVID. The human services um, uh, allocations to reach up in particular are to deal with increasing caseloads um, in reach up as uh, a result of the pandemic. So if you then thumb down to tier two, if flexibility, I perhaps could have been a bit more artful in my labeling there, um, but these are uh, allocations that the governor in his budget would make if provided additional flexibility from the US Treasury. Keep in mind the Treasury is the one that sets the guidelines as to the use of the funds. Um, the guidelines uh, uh, required uh, expenses to be paid or uses of the fund to be exclusively for COVID related spending. Um, it couldn't replace budget items that were already in the budget. Uh, there was no su supplantation, it's called. Um, and also, um, it had to be, uh, it could not be revenue replacement. So, you know, if your revenues, for example, in our case, are down $182 million, you couldn't just cut a check for $182 million to the general fund. Um, so there were certain restrictions. Oh, the final restriction, which I think is important, um, is that the money had to be spent by December 30th of this year. Now, all of these are, I would say, in play in terms of the guidelines that have been given. Um, we've heard, um, as many of you probably have, there's been um, endless, uh, some would say, ad nauseum discussions in DC about changing the flexibility, about changing the uh, time period when the money has to be spent, about allowing for revenue replacement, about allowing for non-COVID related expenses. All of these things are in play. But the reason that we put these appropriations in a tier two is that we believe they require some additional flexibility in the guidelines. So the first on that list, if we do have additional flexibility would be Vermont State Colleges, which at the moment we're not convinced would, um, would, um, be eligible for a coronavirus relief fund. But the governor you know, did want to express um, his interest um, in providing that as a first stop if we are provided more flexibility, $30 million. The other items there um, are you know, also um, items that we believe may or may not apply, but would if we had greater flexibility. So that's really the first, um, the first item that I bring to your attention, is there was 30 million set aside in the budget. If there is additional flexibility, the money is there. Um, you know, it's not mythical money if people don't spend their appropriations, uh, the money is there, um, but we would need um, kind of call it permission from uh, the US Treasury to operate. You know, I did want to point out uh, as a side note, um, thinking about when we constructed this budget, I think members uh, will be aware that we reached out to departments and actually originally we had asked departments to reduce their um, general fund by 5%. That was based on early guidance that we gave that came um, in the early part, of, I think it was the first week of July. It was literally, I think the week after um, the Q1 budget passed, uh, you know, we. Went out, had a few drinks, got a long sleep, and then came right back in and issued budget instructions for the upcoming um, year. In those instructions, we were uh, asking departments to take a 5% reduction because based on what we knew at the time, we didn't know that we would have the surplus that came in. Uh, we didn't know the extent uh, of the revenue uh, that we would have available. We thought that would be what we would need. Subsequently, um, as revenue came in and we kind of 
re, uh, re-looked at where we stood, we reduced that um, to 3% for departments. We did not ask uh, the University of Vermont and Northern Vermont State Colleges to do the same. But you should know that we did ask virtually every other unit um, or organization that receives state money um, to, to take a 3% reduction. That includes the Vermont Arts Council, that includes the Vermont Historical Society, that includes the Vermont Symphony, um, as well as the Vermont Humanities Council. So we were pretty severe on that. I mean, these are not organizations you know, bursting with money. Some of them have other sources, private donations and the like, but none of them are living high on the hog. And we didn't feel good about that, but we did believe that, you know, what asking agencies and departments to um, pull in their belts, we thought it would be only fair. But we did know, you know, and acknowledge that the state colleges as well as the University of Vermont were in pretty tough straits. And we just thought it would be unreasonable to ask them to do the same. So, um, I, you know, I did want to point that out. And, and the final comment I'll make, and, and then be happy to take your questions, is we are aware um, that there is um, a commission either studying or about to study the future of the state colleges. Um, and we await their report. Um, you know, we hope to um, keep track of what they say, uh, but we think it's an important thing. And to the extent that uh, their conclusions uh, require uh, buy-in from the governor and require appropriations, we would be happy to consider. And I'll, uh, I know that was a kind of a quick uh, overview, but I uh, figured I would leave plenty of time for questions. If thank you. I, I will open it up for questions. I, I, um, I think we're all well aware that there are, this is a, a pretty challenging time for businesses and some of them are not going to be existing. Some of them have already closed doors permanently and some are looking at them. My, my question here for you is, um, we also have a report that says that for the, the Vermont State College is needed 30 million and we've already, we've uh, I think appropriated five of that already. Um, it, are we putting the state colleges at a risk that might be might be more than, than the state can can bear? And is there a strategy that the governor has going forward to address the needs of the Vermont State Colleges during this time, just to hold them together to get through this time? Is there a strategy that the governor is planning to put forward? Well, I think the strategy that was put forward um, by the legislature, which the governor agreed with, um, was to put together a, you know, a group of wise men and women to study the issue and come out with recommendations. Um, I think you know, who better place than people who've been in the business and worked in that area to uh, come out with recommendations. Uh, the governor will be one of the first people at the table um, to listen to what they have to say and to consider options. But uh, we're, you know, we're not interested in front running that committee that is currently, um, I think, to be appointed to uh, study the issue. Um, and to the extent, as I said earlier, to the extent that that requires appropriation and, and requires additional money to be put in, um, we would be happy to listen. But um, at this point, we're, we're not willing to make that commitment until we have we see a plan. So I'm looking at this. So you say that there's about 200 million that we have sitting in the bank right now. Of, of That's correct. Um, and you are looking at applying 152 million to tier one that you believe already meets criteria. That's for correct. For TRF. And right. if you end up in tier two, you see that as we're not sure if that meets criteria? Yes. And if it can be proven that it does meet criteria? Uh, we would be very interested in that conversation. You know, I, I want to be clear that you know, it, it, we, we didn't put the state colleges there because we thought they were a second tier consideration. We're well aware of their financial challenges and, and they spoke to us and I think they spoke very articulately. We're aware of that. We're just simply not aware that we have uh, federal money in this pool that uh, is eligible to be put towards the state colleges. But we're very happy to have the conversation if the legislature or you know, if a bunch of smart people disagree with us, we're very happy to listen. I hope you'll stay while we um, hear from the Vermont State Colleges. Hope you'll be able sure. to stay. Thank you. Representative James.
Thanks. Um, yeah, and I, I guess um, speaking not as one who has the answer yet, but just having, you know, having read Dr. Page's report, um, I guess I just want to put a pitch in that I think finding an answer and finding this funding is is really vital. Um, you know, I, I think that Dr. Page made uh, a pretty strong case in his report uh, to the JFO in June. Um, and, you know, and I'm just going to put a put a quick uh, quote here um, that continued uh, continued funding uh, continued bridge funding for the state colleges sends a timely, powerful, and much needed message that state leadership understands and supports the state's educational needs and the critical role that the Vermont State College system plays in meeting this needs. So I really hope that we can work together um, to find, find an answer um, and find it quickly because I, I think that the reports coming um, from the select committee uh, won't be coming until next spring. And so I, I think that we're probably not gonna be able to wait for an answer. I, I think we're gonna be able to, I think we're gonna have to find the funding now um, and then, uh, you know, work together to find a long-term solution for the colleges when the reports come due. Understood. Thank you. It's, it's sort of in a sense of uh, life supports while we find a cure, in a sense. Are there other questions from the committee? Okay, then... Um, Commissioner Gresham, if you could stay with us for a little while, I'm sure more will come up after we hear from the Vermont State Colleges. So um, we have Commissioner Zadatny, who will speak to us. We have heard, we have heard the committee did attend a um, previous session with you, but we did not actually have you in the same room with Commissioner Gresham. So following what, what he says, what Tell us about the impact on the Vermont State Colleges uh, without this funding. Uh, if we don't get the funding, we'll obviously have to take significant action. And I would anticipate it would be action comparable to what was proposed back in the spring. Uh, we very much hope that won't be the case. Uh, we're looking to have uh, a breathing space again to let the select committee and also our internal task force uh, work through um, the transformation of the Vermont State Colleges. I will say I'm very encouraged because it's it's apparent that there is a strong recognition, I would say across the board, including internally at the VSC, that we do need to have transformative change. Uh, we've already undertaken um, steps to move in that direction, which I view as kind of the building blocks for whatever the, the, the final outcome is based on the legislative select committee and our internal task force, but we're already trying to um, take to heart the words of Jim Page with regard to not functioning as a federation and truly moving towards being a system because I think it will put us in a much better position than to be more nimble in making change when that change comes. But again, we do need the breathing space um, and that's the reality we're facing. We've we were obviously already facing structural challenges prior to COVID hitting, and those were documented through the, the white paper that was put out last year by the chancellor um, and were addressed in Jim Page's report as well. Uh, and then when we had COVID hit, um, that obviously accelerated the financial changes we were in. And again, we're not alone. I mean, this is a, there are a lot of um, colleges and universities across the states where that weren't a, in as challenging a situation as we were that are now facing um, you know, significant financial uh, peril due to, due to COVID. But having COVID hit while we were already looking at structural change that needed to happen, um, we ran out of runway. So really what we're looking for with this bridge funding is the runway to make the change that we know we need to make. Um, what are some of the, the, the changes that you have? What are some of the steps that you've taken? So we have already um, taken steps to develop a system-wide budget. Um, historically, we're, we're one entity. Uh, all our colleges are in one financial boat, so to speak, but we didn't function as a system with regard to our budget. So individual institutions would develop their own budgets. They would uh, estimate what their revenues would be, their enrollments, uh, what their expenses would be. And then at the end of the year, we'd, we'd figure out sort of who, who got it right and who didn't. Um, but given that we are all in one financial boat, we're moving towards having a system-wide budget. We'll be working 
in a, in a highly collaborative way with our colleges, with the presidents and with their business officers regarding the development of a system-wide budget. Because if someone's making decisions at one institution, that has an impact on the other institutions. And I don't think that we were in a position to hold each other accountable that way before. I don't think the board necessarily had the visibility that it needed to have into the budgeting process and the financial situation that we were in. Um, so that's a pretty significant change um, that was passed by our board of trustees uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a meeting yesterday with our finance and facilities committee to lay out what that will look like. This will be a transition year for that creation of a system-wide budget. Um, but we've, we've put those building blocks in place. I don't want to preempt what uh, uh, our chief academic office, officer Yasmin Zisla will be sharing with you later, but our um, internal task force called VSCS Forward made a number of recommendations to our board of trustees and uh, four of those resulted in charges back to me as the chancellor and to the colleges to address things. And again, the focus is on uh, students um, making um, education more accessible for them. And um, those particular charges are things that we're moving forward with. We're developing working groups to um, implement those changes. So things, uh, for example, getting rid of duplicate uh, low enrolled programs between our residential colleges, increasing collaboration in operations between Vermont Technical College and the Community College of Vermont, um, coming up with a general, general, one set of general education requirements that's common across the system to facilitate the ability of students to transfer credits and to take credits at other institutions than the one they're enrolled in. And then also making some changes regarding the framework that we have um, you know, for, for displaying our courses and uh, making it again, just easier for students to access uh, education across the state. Um, so those were pretty significant changes that we're working on. We're working on a pretty tight timeline for that, um, our focus is going to be on students, what's in the best interests of students, our current students, our future students. And the other significant piece is the priorities of, of the state, because we do exist for the benefit of Vermont. And we're hoping out of the legislative select committee that we will get um, additional guidance on what it is the state needs the Vermont State Colleges to do. Because again, we span a pretty significant spectrum from our community college through our technical college to our traditional you know, four-year residential colleges. So we, we, we do provide a lot of different options uh, to students across the whole state. But as, as you understand, I mean, structurally that's been expensive to do and particularly with um, the demographic challenges that we're facing here in Vermont, given that so many of our students are Vermont-based students. So um, <laughs> I, again, Yasmin can discuss those in, in greater detail uh, later on when she talks to you. When, when does the, when, at what point are you in financial peril? You have some money now, you have some money appropriated, you've got some tuition coming in. Where do, where do things really start to become uh, a challenge, the, the big challenge? So I know what, so we, we have on the, the call here as well, we have Sharon Scott, who's our chief financial officer and chief operational officer. And I know she answered that question for house appropriations, but I think it's, it makes more sense for her to answer it. I know what she said last time, but I will let her <laughs> answer that for you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the question. I, I really appreciate it. First of all, we are incredibly grateful for the uh, actions that occurred a little bit earlier this summer. Um, the fact that the state appropriation was issued for the first quarter in a single lump sum, that we received the $5 million in bridge, that we received the 12.515 million in uh, CARES Act funding has allowed us to have a little bit of breathing room and space with which to operate. Um, we do also have the 22.758 million, which we have not drawn in yet um, for the second round of CARES, uh, CRF funding, which is very helpful. But looking at those sorts of activities, um, we would be looking at later this fall as our likeliest activity where it would be um, more difficult. We are, of course, um, still tabulating what that looks like. Uh, many of our uh, schools have not gotten through their at drop period. Um, the Community College of Vermont has not yet started and NVU Online has not yet started. So we don't have a firm picture yet of what the fall looks like. Um, so in the coming couple of weeks, we will be pulling more of that information together for you. But at the present time, a rough estimate is later this fall um, in the November, December timeframe. 
So there's some uh, significant value in knowing now. Absolutely. What yeah. the answer is, because if we don't, if we don't address this within the next month, you're, you're at that crunch time. That's why we're really grateful you're taking this up right now. The other, the other challenge is the message that it sends to students, because again, one of the challenges has been as, as long as our future is uncertain, uncertainty translates to um, people hesitating to enroll. So it, these things are very much connected. Um, other questions? Representative Austin. Can you want, there you are. I am. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here today. I guess, again, when I'm reading, you know, the white paper, and then when I'm reading through the Chronicle of Higher Education, you know, this seems like a national issue in terms of the, you know, due to demographics. And I think Sophie mentioned that, looking demographically at Vermont and nationally, the small pool of tuition paying students going to post-secondary state colleges. In the best case scenario, um, what, how many students or what percent of your budget uh, would be tuition from students? And what are you, you know, what were you anticipating pre-COVID and what are you anticipating for maybe 2022? in terms so of the students that are coming. Right, I mean, historically, we're, we're very tuition dependent uh, and approximately 78% of our revenue comes from students in the form of tuition, room and board and uh, fees. Um, so that's, you know, you know, we are very, very heavily dependent on our students. So in order to cover costs to maintain campuses, et cetera, uh, it means putting up um, tuition, again, if we don't, you know, historically our base appropriation um, covers about, I think, 18% overall across the system. It's different amounts for different institutions. Um, so that's, that is a challenge. And then, so we have two issues with that. One is affordability for students, that that then becomes a barrier to students coming. Um, and the other um, is, is accessibility. Um, so we, we want to make sure as we move forward, I think, accessibility and affordability are going to be absolutely critical as we try to redefine uh, what the Vermont State College is, is and how it operates. And a focus on affordability is going to be right up there along with access. Um, but obviously that's, um, you know, that's, that's where uh, the bulk of our, our revenue comes from. Um, yeah. Thank you. Representative Common. Uh, thanks. Uh, while we have Commissioner Gresham uh, still with us, um, this ties back into funding in the sense that there's a lot of competition for a shrinking pool of money. Uh, and then looking through the tier one appropriations, I don't see any money being appropriated to the public school system. And my understanding is that, um, you know, the House had, had indicated it wanted to set aside $100 million in case there was more money needed. Um, in talking with my own district and other districts, uh, the need is going to be far greater than what was anticipated, I think back in March and April. Um, and so I'm just, I guess I'd like, I'm concerned about the competition for money. And if the public school system needs another 50 million, uh, how we balance that with the need of the, of, of the governor asking for 133 for uh, commerce and community development alone. Um, so I, I guess if you could comment a little bit on the decision to have no money out of the remaining 200 million for public education and how you see the competition for that money affecting what might be available tier two for the state colleges. Well, I think this conversation is all about competition for funds. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, I think, why I'm sitting here and why we're having this conversation. Um, but it should illustrate that, I mean, not only does the state colleges need money, that, but we're hearing that uh, public schools need money. Any one of you who lives in a village or a town knows that the businesses there need money. And anyone who 
you know, lives or works or observes a hospital knows the hospitals need money. Those are just a few of the, so yes, this is all about competition. Uh, I would note that um, in that um, 152 million uh, of uh, CRF allocations um, to Representative Conlin's point, there was no money there for pre-K through 12. And you know, I think there are a number of reasons for that. First, as everyone is well aware, uh, there was $50 million of pre-K through 12 money for schools in uh, H961, I believe it was. Um, not all of that went to districts. Six and a half of that million went to Efficiency Vermont for HVAC systems. A million and a half went to independent schools. A million went to supervisory unions for administrative. But about $28 million in total went to local districts. Add another $28 million from the federal government for ESSER money. So there's approximately $56 million that are going to local schools. If you ask them, they'll say, I don't know if that's enough. But if you ask them what is enough, they'll also say, I don't know. And that's what I've heard this morning or this afternoon from you know what I've just listened to. We don't know how much is needed. We know there's a need. I would not argue that, but we don't know how much. So I think similarly with pre-K through 12, um, I think AOE just last week sent out a survey to districts to, to, let, to, let, uh, to help educate AOE about how much money they need. We don't know that yet. So, uh, you know, the, whereas there are certain parts of our economy that we know there's a need, you know, we've seen it, we felt it, we've heard it. So I guess, you know, the allocation of funds you know, is always going to be a question, but we know there are certain needs and we don't know the size of the other needs. So I guess what we've decided to do is allocate to where, where we know with some certainty what is needed. And we will be looking at that again tomorrow and happy to have you join us again. We, we will have the secretary in um, as well as um, his team. Sure. Uh, to, to take a look at that as well, as well as the superintendents. I believe we have the superintendents in, is that correct, Phil, to, tomorrow? It, it wasn't my intent to start a debate about public school versus, I just, I, I just, I didn't see any money there. I, I've heard lots of need and I, I appreciate the candor of the answer, thank you. Yes, and thank it's you. a question, certainly a question on everyone's mind because we certainly had the understanding that there was a hundred million that, that the legislature had seen would be set aside to be held for educational needs. Um, we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Madam Chair, if the superintendents um, involve Sue Seglowski, then yes, we're in conversation about adding some people to the agenda tomorrow. Great, yes, I, I did see that email. So yes, I think that, that it included the superintendents. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions for either um, Commissioner Gresham or, or the Chancellor um, regarding the uh, Vermont State Colleges and the bridge funding? Oh, great. Jim, Jim Demaray. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chair Webb. So question for Sophie. Um, how much of... Um, your shortfall is due to a reduction of tuition, if you know. Uh, you mean in th the fact we have lower enrollments this fall? Yeah. Um, I don't know that I know the answer to that. Uh, Sharon may have a, a better answer, but um, one of the challenges, as, as she noted, was we're still in the very early stages of the semester. So Castleton and Northern Vermont University started class last week. Vermont Tech, I believe, started yesterday. Um, so part of it's going to be waiting to see whether students, the ones we have already that have, have enrolled and, and, and registered will continue because some of them may change their minds. Um, so we don't have final numbers yet. We'll know better once we get into September in terms of our actual numbers. Um, but we have had, um, you know, we, we don't have the same level of enrollment. And of course, we have a significantly less as far as room and board goes, because we do have a lot of students that are commuting or, or uh, um, you know, going to be taking classes online. So that's, that also has an impact on, uh, on our revenues. So I don't know, Sharon, if you have anything additional to that. Um, as of last week, enrollments uh, varied at our institution as uh, a decline in enrollment of approximately 11% um, in the best case scenario to a decline in enrollment of about 23%. 
um, that's quite a significant variance. As the chancellor noted, um, room and board is a significant portion of our revenue source. Um, and again, we have uh, participation in room and board that's between 66% uh, down from the prior year to about 45% down to the prior year. So they vary quite significantly uh, depending on the institution um, and the method by which they um, are choosing to teach uh, students this fall. Great, thank you. Other questions? Okay, I, Representative Fagan, did you have anything to add at this point? Not right now. Thank you. Our mission is not to find the money. This, this committee's job is not to find the money. Our, our, the focus of this committee is to provide a response to uh, the uh, Appropriations Committee on uh, just our, our response to the, the governor's budget. And um, I think given the amount of work we did last year on the, on the uh, select committee and, and listening to the colleges, it's a, of interest in, to this committee. Um, I'll speak for myself as an interest on my part to see that we provide uh, the splint that the colleges need until we can get to the, until we can get them into surgery. And I appreciate the amount of work that they're doing, and I really apologize for that analogy. It's terrible, and I hope nobody quotes it. <laughs> I think just getting to the point that that we just need to see them through while we come up with the final solution. Um, so thank you. Um, we are going to hear from next. We're going to hear from um, the UVM and uh, the Vermont State Colleges. I wanted to hear from UVM because you have a budget. Uh, you're you're on the on the the budget, um, and also we're interested in hearing um, where you are with your your CRF fund uses and needs. So I think we have Wendy, don't we? Wendy Koenig in the room. I don't think she has arrived yet, Madam okay. Chair. Okay, uh, we but we do have Susan Stightley. So let's start with Susan, who represents the. Um, Association of Vermont Independent Colleges to just give us an update on how things are going there. So welcome. Hello, Hello all. Thank you uh, for inviting me today and for considering the private colleges. Um, you've probably re been reading that uh, the students are starting to come back on campus and testing is going relatively well. There are some cases, but uh, they're few in number so far and quarantining is working well and isolating students. Um, we have, uh, just want to mention, we haven't had any uh, COVID funding from the state, although there was legislation that uh, ultimately said that in conjunction with the health department, if we can't find the funding for the various testing, it may be considered that um, there might be some funds for that. But of course, we have many needs, like uh, all the colleges, you know, drop in enrollment, the testing costs, uh, you know, loss of students. And I don't, I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of the drop in enrollment, but there has been some. Uh, students are just starting to come back on campus now uh, and over the next through couple of weeks because they've been coming back in tears, but there is definitely significant losses. Uh, so we, you know, we are one of the reasons, uh, one of the key reasons why out of state students and people from out of state and young people move to Vermont. So we are fulfilling that critical need of getting youth here into the state. So we are key to the industry. And uh, I, it's an, and, you know, and you all know we've lost four colleges in the last couple of years. And this situation could result in more colleges being lost, which hurts the Vermont students, the communities, uh, and uh, the state as well. Higher education in general is the third um, largest industry in the state in terms of wages and salaries. And we are the fourth largest industry in the state in terms of employment. So we are a huge sector. Um, and I think we need to be thought of as a business and uh, as an industry uh, because we are vital to the economy as well as educators, which is of course our primary goal is to uh, educate you know, many different types of, types of students. But I do feel we can't afford to lose any more colleges. Um, so 
I, in listening to the testimony uh, and the different tiers, um, I'm wondering if the, the, the GEAR funding, the Governor's Emergency Higher Education funding, uh, relief funding, if that has all been allocated or if there's still funding uh, left there as well, uh, because certainly our institutions need some additional resources as well. Um, Commissioner Gresham, do you have that information? I believe he might have just left. Might have left. Oh. <laughs> uh, so definitely, um, I'm hoping there is still funding there. You might, yeah, I know it's not your job to look for the funding, but uh, we have losses. I'm um, just, you know, trying to get a sense, and I haven't gotten census uh, information from everyone, but actual loss of students in the fall. Uh, not every college has reported yet, but that's at uh, 33. Uh, million dollars. Uh, the COVID testing and cleaning is probably going to be around at least five million. Uh, so, you know, we have no, and some schools, uh, SIT in um, the Brattleboro area, you know, their students are international, so they are really struggling because they don't have students coming back to campus. Um, all the other colleges are having students come back except for um, Vermont College of Fine Arts and Goddard because they're low residency. So they're gonna be doing their, their programs online. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, and I ha haven't heard if they've lost any students or perhaps even gained some because they are online. And Vermont Law School is, most, is online as well. Uh, but about 40% of their students are in the community, have come back into the community and will be using uh, you know, the resources at, at the college. Um, you said that, it, that the the colleges are the fourth largest industry in the state. Is that just the privates, just the independents? No, that's all of higher ed, public oh, ed. Yeah, oh, okay. and, as, and the same with a third of uh, largest industry with the wages and salaries, that's higher ed in general. Yeah, okay. Uh, I know many states uh, have given, uh, the GEAR funding has gone a portion of, because it was specifically written to include the private uh, sector, college sector in the GEAR money, it wasn't just for public and for K through 12. And other states have been allocating some of their funds uh, to the private college sector. So I would ask that you do the same. You did have access through uh, different uh, economic grants, I believe. No, we didn't. Uh, the, the grants that came up uh, all required a 50% loss in one month. Uh, and that's not how colleges operate. So uh, we, we weren't eligible to, pro to provide, um, apply to those, for those grants. So when you're considering new grants, I certainly hope you expand them more to the nonprofit sector and make it not so restrictive so um, that other institute colleges can apply for those grants as well. Thank you. Um, I see that we have Richard Kate in the room. Are there any questions for Susan before we move on there? I don't think I'm seeing any. Yeah. So um, welcome Richard Kate from the University of Vermont. Good afternoon. We are in the process of reviewing the governor's budget. Um, I don't have that here, but I, my understanding is I think you were level funded. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So can you put, just give us an update on, on where you are, um, as well as uh, any uses of, of COVID relief funds and expectations going forward? Uh, absolutely. I, don't, I think you have uh, the, the table that I would, I would be referencing to. I don't know if you... Do you have that, Phil? Uh, yes, I believe so. I'll put it up in a second. Thank you. And Phil, you've got the... You've got the second one that Wendy sent, right? The updated one? I believe this is the second one, but you can confirm in a second. Is that the right one? Uh, it is. Thank you. Thank you. And this is on our website as well. So if you so, have trouble seeing it. I tried to uh, cordon off the, the COVID uh, funding in, into uh, segments here. The first set, as it says, is the money that you were good enough to give us for FY20 uh, at 
the vast majority of that was spent in terms of re room refunds and meal refunds to students. Uh, we did have expenses associated with additional compensation and leave and, uh, and uh, a few other things. We had just started to um, work on expending money for technology. Of course, it was just a very short period of time there. So um, not, not a lot of time to encumber all those costs. The second section um, is in the FY21 allocation that you gave us, um, which we're working on now. We've expended about half, uh, expended or encumbered about half of this money and it will all be spent out before December 30th. Um, bigger pieces here in terms of technology and hardware for remote instruction. Um, a lot of purchases for sanitizer, plexiglass, uh, gloves, uh, masks, and a wide variety of other things. Um, biggest piece, as you can see, is about $6 million for testing for this semester. Um, we we uh, contracted with one firm to um, basically do uh, testing of students before they arrive. So um, we wanted to maximize the possibility of catching anyone um, ahead of time before they got to campus. And then on the first day that they set foot on campus, uh, testing begins weekly uh, for students. Um, I, if you can excuse me for one second, I'm gonna close the window. You're, you're probably gonna hear more of College Street here than you want to. Just, just bear with me. <clears throat> I still uh, can I just interrupt for a second. Do we have this document posted? I'm trying to pull it up. It, it's on our website. If you look under today. There, there are two listed. It is the one that is listed as COVID table, expenditures tables, I believe. Okay. Under Wendy Koenig's name. Okay, I'm all set. Thank you very much. Um, sorry for the interruption. Um, and then um, another big piece is additional financial aid for the semester for students. Uh, and then some of the facilities modifications we've been doing in terms of everything from air handling to plexiglass uh, installation and, and the like. Uh, you may recall uh, that you also within uh, this allocation gave us funding for what we are calling the Office of Engagement. Uh, the legislation calls it the University Business Resources Center. And so this is uh, where the university was um, given the, uh, the goal of uh, expanding economic development and job creation and, and leveraging the university's uh, people and, and program resources toward that end. Uh, this money, uh, I will, just a very quick explanation. In order to be efficient about this, we did not want to try to spend all this money in, in a six month period uh, because we felt it would be wasteful. So basically uh, what we're doing is um, ex actually expending the cash during a period on programs, um, expenses directly related to COVID and freeing up some of the u university's funding so that we can spread the $2 million over a two year period. So we've developed a million dollar per year budget for each of two years. And um, that work has begun. Uh, the president has appointed uh, Chris Kaliba as a director, um, Professor Chris Kaliba as, as director of the program. And uh, we're in a process of setting up the office now. And I didn't have a specific ask. The, uh, the next two sections are, uh, related to uh, a little more in the future uh, for the second semester of, of, of this year, uh, we could, uh, could be spending as much as $12 million. Again, for very similar categories, the testing would need to continue financial aid, um, uh, more modest amount for technology, but we'll continue to buy uh, equipment and supplies. So this, um, we expect these Continue, uh, these expenses to continue, uh, obviously, throughout the year. And lastly, is and uh, just to give you some idea of some of the revenue shortfalls we've had. Um, as you know, uh, the K 
CARES Act funding is not to be directed uh, necessarily to revenue shortfalls, but I thought I'd give you some sense of what we're dealing with. We have reduced the uh, density in the residence halls by eliminating triple rooms. Uh, so that means there's about $3 million reduction in revenue there. Um, because of COVID, and, and uh, we, we've ended up with more scholarship eligibility on the part of returning students, about $4.5 million. And then we've also reserved some beds for isolation should we need them. Um, so these, again, are beds we can't um, rent out uh, to students as we normally would, a couple million dollars there. Uh, some decline in enrollment. We really won't know exactly where we stand on enrollment until about the first week of September um, after everyone's here and they've made their decisions because even after as students are arriving here right now as I speak, um, there's still that what we call melt where, where, where some students are lost in that two week period where they don't decide not to stay. Um, and then there's another piece here in terms of lost revenue, especially in, from athletics uh, and also conference events. So I don't know if you, um, I can go on on other topics, but uh, just, I don't know if you have any questions on this at all. I personally, I haven't done the arithmetic here, but I'm just trying to sort out um, the, the table that you've given us. So if we look at the first section, actual COVID relief funds, um, appropriated to you through CRF funding through the legislature is 8.6, 8.7 million. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's okay. been expended. And, and there was an a, expectation that this would take you through FY21. Is that, that what you're? No, no. Okay. Uh, the, the first section we had to spend by, the, by June 30th. By June 30th. Okay. The, the second section is the money you gave us for this fiscal year, but it has to be spent by December 30th. So this 19.3 million, um, has, did, we out, did we provide CRF funding to you at that amount? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. And then, so that's supposed to take you through December 30th. Then we get to the, and that's the, so, so then these are the projected uh, expenses for the second semester um, that at this point in time, we actually do not have uh, access to those funds because the funds are supposed to end uh, December 30th. So, the, right. so that's the, the 12 million there. Um, I love the term de-densifying. That's a, that's a definitely yeah. COVID related word. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where the 12 and the 21 well, relate to each other. Yeah, the 12 the 12 are expenses okay. that we expect to incur. The, the last table is really examples of revenue that we are not going to get over the course of the entire year. Okay. So basically what we're saying is those, those are additional challenges. And what we have done in the development of our budget is to reduce allocations to all the units Mm -hmm. begin to try to address some of that revenue loss. Okay, thank you. Um, questions, uh, Representative Austin. Um, just in the last category, uh, the induced revenue shortfalls, though, could those be considered in terms of if we had additional or could we use CRF funding for that, even though it's ref you're making up revenue shortfalls it's due to COVID? So I'm assuming we could use COVID funding if we had it or allocated it to that uh, cat to that group, that 21.2 million. Yeah. Is that correct? The, the need the need is certainly there. I won't speak to legislative council's interpretation of whether or not the CARES Act money can be used directly for that or not, but um, the um, it certainly is all COVID related. Okay, thank you. Okay. So you are looking forward and um, we're, we're still waiting to see what happens with Congress and um, waiting to see what happens with an election and a whole bunch of other things that, that we probably can't answer for you at this point. 
Wendy, did you have anything to add? Um, no, I think that Richard has done a great job of covering this. If anybody has any other questions related to um, anything with UVM and I can answer them, I'm happy to do that. How's it going? <laughs> Students are coming back and um, I'm pretty excited about the fact that that is happening. Um, Houston, I think all of you know that um, we have a very aggressive testing regimen that I think is really helping us to do this safely, um, especially having pre-tests of students being tested before they come to campus, um, in addition to the day zero, day seven, and then weekly testing regimen. So um, we're, we're feeling um, cautiously optimistic. And as you all can imagine that being the university, when we have students back on campus, we all feel better. There, we want them to be um, learning and and doing um, what they're supposed to do. So we're happy about that. Thank you, Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. Um, so as Kate pointed out, there is no CRF money uh, left. Um, that because because uh, Richard Kate said. Uh, you basically are unable to expend any more money than what we've given you uh, by December 31st, which is the deadline or December 20th, whatever, I can't remember. Um, but, we're, but you got a $12 million uh, additional cost and a $21 million loss in revenue. Um, can you put that in the bigger picture of the UVM budget? What that what that all means if there's not no money to make up for any of that coming from the legislature. So basically, what we've done is, um, uh, in addition to the fact that you and I, I do want to express our appreciation for the funding you've given us. Um, after taking that into consideration, we've had to reduce the overall budget by about five percent um, in in order to address what we project to be our lost revenue and our added expenses that won't be covered by the CARES Act funding. I know there's incredible sadness about the um, child care program. Yes. That was yes. Cut. We certainly acknowledge that. We are working on other alternatives, but uh, it's, it's just a, we've had to deal um, with a, a large number of, of program reductions in, in many areas in order to uh, address the need. Okay, any other questions, comments? If not, then we will move on and get an update on the two, uh, the two committees who are looking at um, higher ed in the future. Um, and we have Yasmin Zeisler here, who will speak to us, give, provide an update on the uh, Vermont State College's forward task force. And again, um, Dylan, you are on this committee. So if you have anything to add, please do. So welcome. Great. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show my screen. I think that's, or maybe Phil, you can put up the slides. Uh, yeah, I'll put them up for you, Yasmin. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and while Phil is, is getting started, a, a particular thank you um, to Representative Gian Batista. He was a wonderful part of the task force. This was our internal task force. Um, and it was designed to be a representative group. I would say the group had some really hard conversations, but also some really optimistic and forward looking conversations. That was the direct charge from the board to us to, to really come up with uh, recommendations on what we can do now to take action. If you wanna go ahead, Phil, to the next slide. Um, this is the um, really the guiding vision of the task force in this work. Uh, to highlight a few things for the committee, the, our focus has been just laser focused on students and high quality education that's accessible and affordable. 
Um, I think the range of conversations our task force had, we really recognized the diversity of students that our system serves and realizing that we need to design for that future, reimagine a future for the system that's, that's robust, that's sustainable, um, and come up with some creative ways to serve this breadth of students. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, Phil. Uh, in addition, we, the task force was specifically charged to really be the, the point of taking in information from a lot of other groups and listening to other groups. Um, the task force reviewed the speaker's idea bank, for example. We've had a labor task force in our system um, put forward a proposal that, that the forward task force certainly looked at very carefully. There are other community groups that um, representatives may have heard from, like um, the VSCS Thrive and others, and we've been constantly seeking additional input. Um, but I wanted to share with the committee today results of a survey that we conducted to really get as broad-based um, a set of input as we could. Um, and so this first result on the survey, um, we were asking, uh, and we had 2,400 Vermonters, uh, both our internal communities and external, complete the survey in five days. That represents about 400 hours of Vermonters time to do this. Um, the priorities, when you compare some of our external stakeholders that we targeted, um, and that included school counselors and, and workforce development partners and our own internal uh, constituents, we really had pretty strong agreement about what the priorities are for our system. Affordability, access, and, and strong student support is really what's underneath uh, all of those first access um, concepts. So those were the, the priorities. Uh, Phil, if you wanna go ahead to the next slide. Um, we specifically asked um, survey respondents who identified as, as being part of our workforce partners um, about their perceptions of our graduates. 91% uh, said they're very satisfied or somewhat satisfied with our graduates. So very little dissatisfaction with our graduates. Um, and that, that was good news to us. I think like much of higher ed, you know, need for more hands-on, more communication is always part of it, what people look for. Uh, likewise, school counselor perceptions, we found that Vermonters know the Vermont State College's system. They know why it benefits our students. Um, students choose us for affordability, for the proximity to home, for the small welcoming communities we have in all sorts of ways across our system. And students who aren't choosing us are looking for something different is, is what our school counselors told us. Thanks, Phil. Keep, yeah, keep going. And then just to tease out specific to our student population, and I will say that our survey results really, generally speaking, we, we had representation from all of our colleges and students answering the survey. Uh, and affordability and access, again, um, were student top priorities uh, as well. So that was an important uh, piece that the task force took into account in developing its recommendations. Um, the four that, that you already heard Sophie preview for you, yeah, that's fine, Phil, you can keep going. Um, I'm gonna share with you the four recommendations that are now moving forward. Our board approved these for action. The first recommendation is really about improving affordability and preserving access to high quality programs for students. And it's focused on Castleton and Northern Vermont University, recognizing that academic programs there, there's a substantial degree of overlap in the academic programs offered. Uh, and so our next step, we're, we're in the process of convening a task force um, to look at this and develop a way to evaluate these, um, to think new, in new and different ways about how to preserve student access to these programs. Um, and finally, I will say uh, with all this work that our group has had a real sense of urgency um, about the need to move forward and about the need to have clear answers for students uh, as we go into the next academic year uh, about what our priorities are. So this is the first recommendation. 
The second one is also about it really about an access expansion and operational efficiencies and it's focused on the Community College of Vermont and Vermont Tech. They already do, you've probably heard many times, um, a lot of the synergies between those two institutions. I'll highlight a few. They already uh, utilize a single library between the two institutions. Um, and they already work very closely together to deliver really critical uh, workforce development programs such as the nursing pathway. Um, they kind of go hand in hand together to, to build out programs in that area. So this recommendation is, is really to, to build on that good work and come up with the next, next steps and next uh, opportunities to do some of that expansion and, and look for some of that operational synergy. And then finally, uh, the final two recommendations are really about increasing flexibility for students and recognizing one of the things that was a real theme in the survey results um, from students was they recognized that, hey, we can, we can learn on Zoom, we can learn online for a lot of us that helps us balance work and family and school. Um, certainly there are students who are also saying, and I really want to talk to my peers in person, but this, this layer of flexibility that uh, some online delivery offers is really, really about um, these recommendations, as well as understanding that our students are moving within the system quite a bit. And so getting crystal clear about a, a general education program core that a student can count on, whether they've been an early college student in one location, whether they've come in and done a one-year certificate program that had some general education embedded in it, um, that student has the confidence to know that that's part of their general education requirement wherever they go. Um, so those are the, the pieces there. And then as well as sort of showing students much more clearly the range of online offerings and making that much more accessible um, for all kinds of students to access. And with that, Phil, I think you can go on to the final slide. So as I said, we, we are convening these working groups. I think we have a strong commitment to, to an inclusive, transparent process around uh, representation and communication in that work. Um, we are expecting to leverage some of the CRF funds that we've already that you've already um, uh, targeted uh, where it's appropriate to support some of the, the doing this work with facilitation and, and additional consulting. Uh, and we've set very ambitious timelines for this fall to to do the work. And with that, I will pause for any questions. Or Dylan, jump in. <laughs> what did I miss? <laughs> You're muted, Kate. <laughs> I can't believe I need that reminder, but I do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dylan, do you have something that you'd like to add at this point? I'll just be very brief. I, I think uh, that was a very good presentation. But just to acknowledge that this is very challenging work. Um, and that each of the campus communities uh, is under a lot of stress. And so with the backdrop of what we've heard about the real uh, fundamental piece of funding our state colleges system, uh, we really need to understand the human toll that it's been taking the last six months. It's been very challenging. Uh, our higher education institutions have adapted very quickly. And I just was very impressed by the commitment of all the stakeholders um, on the task force. And there were many from different communities, be it employees or administrators. Uh, there was a student representative and all of them came to this all in the shared spirit of ensuring that the VSC's future is very bright. So I just really wanna thank everyone and acknowledge their good work. Uh, certainly they put in a lot of time and this will be a very difficult transition and they are partners in that. So to the extent we can be partners, and support our state colleges, I think that's a very good policy for the state of Vermont. Thank you. Um, Representative Austin, and then Representative Conlon. I just wanna quickly say thank you so much for that survey, for the information that was extremely helpful. And um, especially to hear the amount of student voice uh, coming through on that survey. 
was really good to hear. So thank you very, very much for that. Yeah. Representative Common. Uh, thanks. Um, I think when you say you put forth an ambitious schedule, uh, the deadlines of October 1st, uh, that's understating it. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, I like the um, uh, sort of the link between Vermont Tech and CCV and um, try to go with co-located spaces. CCV already co-locates in some cases at technical centers across the state. And I didn't know if technical centers um, were part of the conversation as you looked at VTC and CCV in there, um, or if that was just sort of uh, a bite too big to take in all the work that you're doing. I will say that from the task force's perspective, right, it was really focused on what, what can we get our arms around. I, I appreciate the, the broader spirit of that question, right? Um, I, you know, I think in, in increasing the collaboration of Vermont Tech and, and CCV on, on program delivery, right, they're, they're, it, clearly there is opportunity there. Um, for how they might deliver programs in other locations. You know, they're, they're doing programming in Central Vermont Medical Center, you know, so do you do it in a tech center? Do you do it in an employer base? There's just, you know, I think we need to think nimbly and creatively. Representative James. Yeah, just a, a scheduling question. I think I missed, um, when is your final report due? What, what was the calendar after here? Thanks. Um, I think I think at this point, you know, the task force delivered recommendation to the board that the board took action on immediately. So uh, we are waiting for for further direction at this point. If if there's more work the task force needs to do, but I think we've got a lot of you know the just the select committee's work and um, so. I'll gotcha. So VSC that. forward. Yeah. Maybe that's that's that. I, w I would just um, add in on that is that the uh, the task force, the VSCS Forward Task Force met twice a week since it was created at the beginning of June. Uh, it took an enormous amount of time and effort from very, very busy people. So they're kind of taking a little breather right now. Uh, the board of trustees will be coming together in September at their upcoming meeting to really focus on what are the priorities that the board of trustees has for the Vermont State Colleges moving forward. And we anticipate coming out of that, that there will be further direction to the VSCS forward task force. So they're taking a well needed um, break here with the start of the semester, but they had, uh, as I understand it from Yasmin, they had expressed their willingness to continue um, to wrestle with some of these really challenging issues and to continue to be a resource for the board moving forward. So they, they are still, they haven't been disbanded as yet. That's right. That's great. Thanks. Representative Fagan. Thank you. Sophie, can you um, remind us, because I've heard three different numbers, what is the total amount of bridge funding necessary? Not, not in addition, not taking into <laughs> account what we've already provided, but what is the total amount of bridge funding necessary, please? Right now it's 23.8 million. Okay. And we did share with, I know many of you were on the, the meeting that we had last week with House Appropriations. We did provide um, to fill a copy essentially of the same presentation um, to you as well. And that sets forth what we've already received and then how we're calculating that 23.8. And I'm more than happy to go through that if you want, but um, hopefully that will be part of your materials too. Well, because our committee was actually present at that meeting, um, I'm going to see if we can pull that over to our website as well, and I'll see if I can I can find that. Okay. For you. I, I mean, I think we sent it to Phil earlier oh, today, okay. just with a cover slide on that was specific to this committee, but it's essentially the same presentation that we provided last week, but it has this, the breakdown on the last couple of slides. Right. Thank you. Is that the one I received from Sharon? That's right, thanks, Phil. Then that one is up on our website. Okay, great, thank you, Phil. So I wanna turn now to Joyce Manchester, who's been working with the select group. Um, and she's just gonna provide us a, an, an update on where, where they are, um, where it's going, anything that you can give us, Joyce, to have a better understanding of the, the status of the select committee. And there's also going to be a question, I think, for us, is there something that we need to do 
as changes to that come forward. And I, Jim is in the room, I believe. Um, our our uh, ledge council, are, if there are things that we should, we should be attending to in legislation. Sure, thank you very much. Um, as you know, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office. I'm not a member of the committee. I'm simply helping the committee as, as a representative of, of JFO. Um, so I'd like to start with the document that looks at the background on the select committee. Phil, if you could put that up, please. Yes. So this document is really just stealing from the JFO website devoted to the select committee on the future of public higher education in Vermont. And I wanted to be sure that each of you had easy access to that web page because the web page will contain meeting notices, all the public meetings that will come in the future and also the agendas for those meetings, any background information for the committee and so forth. So starting at the top, as you know, Act 120, passed by the General Assembly last spring, created the Select Committee. Um, the JFO webpage link is right there for you, so you can click on that and get to the latest information on the Select Committee. The webpage includes the legislation, so you can read that in all of its glory <laughs> and uh, see exactly what it is that you want the Select Committee to do. Uh, the web page also has some featured resources, so I've highlighted three of those here. You can read the request for proposals that JFO issued back on June 30th. So this was looking for a consulting group to help the select committee in its work. Uh, lots of data analysis, lots of process work, lots of working with stakeholders and uh, trying to come to consensus in terms of recommendations and the final report. I've also listed here the report on funding for the Vermont State Colleges system that was published on June 9th by Jim Page, former chancellor of the University of Maine system. You all are familiar with that. And also the treasurer's Vermont State Colleges final report. So, so that's just meant to be a handy list of resources for you all to access at any point now or in the future. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so let me say a few words about what's happened with uh, choosing the consultant. So uh, when we issued the request for proposals back at the end of June, we were looking at a time frame that would request the final report from the select committee by the end of December of 2021. And as the select committee got together for the first, I, I'm sorry, I have to back up. Only five members of the select committee are on the steering group. And the steering group was tasked with choosing the consultant who would help the full select committee. So most of the work to date has been done by the steering group, just those five individuals um, in, in trying to uh, get to a clear picture of what it is that we wanted the consultant to do and on what time frame. So in thinking through the time frame, the steering group came to the conclusion with a little bit of prodding by Jim Page and others, came to the conclusion that it would really be better to have the final report by the spring of 2021. And there are lots of reasons for that, but one reason is that the legislature will still be in session and could actually take action on some of the recommendations. A second reason is that the uh, colleges and universities will still be in session and so they could actually think about it and perhaps start to think through some of the recommendations that might be made. And finally, we think that it could save the state another year's worth of bridge funding, because if we can implement some of those proposals uh, prior to the fall semester of 2021, um, it means that there could be some cost savings in 2021 that otherwise would be foregone. So there are lots of good reasons to move up the schedule. So um, we are working with some of the um, consulting groups in order to be sure that they can abide by that schedule. But we are now thinking firmly that the final report will be due in April of 2021. Any questions about that? Oh yes, and I should mention 
that the legislation does say on or before December 2021. And so according to alleged counsel, thank you very much, Jim Demaray, um, we do not need to change the legislation. We are covered there. Great. And any questions about all that? Okay. Um, the, uh, here, of course, there's always sure. a question after. Um, who, who, could you tell us the members of the steering committee? Yes, yeah, so the next document that's available on your website and that Phil will put up on the screen, I hope. Thank you. Great. Right, so here are all the members on the select committee. And you can see that those names with asterisks are also on the steering committee. So I'll just run through the names on the select committee and a note who is also on the steering committee. So Joyce Judy was selected as chair of the select committee and she's also functioning as chair of the steering committee, which uh, I'm sorry, steering group, which makes sense. She's president of Community College of Vermont. Uh, Briar Alpert is a member of the University of Vermont Board of Trustees. He was previously president and CEO of Biotech. He's also on the steering group. Just this morning, we got notice that Senator Baruf has been named to the, the uh, select committee. So as you know, he's also Professor of English at UVM. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary at the Vermont Agency of Education, also on the steering group. Sarah Buxton, Director of Workforce Development at the Vermont Department of Labor, also on the steering group. Megan Kluver is a Vermont State College's trustee and uh, her full-time job is with Deloitte Consulting in the global higher education practice. She's also on the steering group. Daniel Daly is associate professor of math and computer science at NVU Linden. Uh, Dr. Garamella from University of Vermont, he's the president. Scott Giles or Giles, I'm not sure which, president of the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. And as you know, Kathleen James, your very own, is um, a member of the select committee. Devin Tingle is a student at Vermont Technical College. Jeff Weld is an alumnus of Castleton University and works with Casella Waste, Waste Systems, Inc. And finally, Sophie Zatby, Chancellor at BSCS, is also a member. We have two more members who have not yet been named. The steering, oh, I, I messed up on this, <laughs> on this page. It should say the steering group. Very confusing to have the select committee and the steering group. The steering group is tasked with naming two representatives from the business community. And they simply have not done that yet, but it's, it's definitely on their list of things to do. So that will be 15 members that will complete the select committee. Thank you very much. Questions? Well, Kathleen, do you have anything to add at this point as our as our house member? At this point, no, that was very that was very thorough. Thank you. Any questions going forward at this point? So to um, to Jim Demaray, you don't see at this point that there's anything that we need to respond to. I believe Jim had to jump off. Okay. We can follow up with him later. Thank you very much. Um, this was an important committee to our to our committee. So we appreciate hearing uh, the status of that. Sure. Um, with that, are there any additional questions? And I'm going to um, ask uh, Peter Fagan as a representative of the Appropriations Committee to help guide us through what it is appropriations uh, will be looking for and what they what they would like from our committee. Thank you, Representative Webb. So right now we are working through uh, the budget, um, both the, the dollars and the language that pertains to it, as has been recommended by the administration. Uh, it is not a three quarter year budget. It is the budget document is the whole budget year and it will take precedence over the one quarter year budget that had previously been passed where appropriate. Uh, otherwise it would get very confusing very quickly. 
So we, by perhaps the end of this week, I doubt it, but early next week, um, the numbers should come in, should start firming up. We have yet to make decisions on numbers. Uh, we have uh, two, public, as, you, as you all heard on the floor today, we had two public hearings scheduled for later on this week. We do not make final decisions on, on, uh, on pieces of the budget until after that. Um, so we are attempting to figure out the bridge funding for this. The colleges are level funded from, from year to year right now, as is, I'm trying to think here, pretty much everything. I'm, I'm not going to say everything is level funded, but pretty much everything is level funded uh, year to year or reduced, uh, correction, reduced actually um, from, from year to year. And uh, trying to find the, the bridge fund is the, is the big challenge to this. Um, as you've heard, they need an additional $23.8 million beyond the, uh, the $12.5 million that they have already received for bridge funding. And that 12.5 does include seven and a half million of CRF money for bridge funding. So there's, there are questions there, um, but that's where we are. Um, so what we're going to be asking of you folks is when we can finally, and I'll, I'll be obviously part and parcel of this, uh, when we finally ascertain how we're going to do this bridge funding, um, I'll come in and do a presentation of that, and uh, and uh, we'll be asking for your approval thereof, and then we'll move forward. Okay, so then we're waiting for you rather than you're waiting for us. Is that what you're okay. saying? Well, at this point in time, because it's it's you'd be saying yes to a to a to a dollar sign and a bunch of blanks, you yeah. know. So I do not see how it could be anything other than that. Thank you. I wished it was different. We appreciate the clarity. <laughs> so we don't have to start looking under the couch cushions. No, not not yet. But if you do want to have some ice cream or some uh, lemonade sales, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Any questions there for folks? Representative Austin. Yes, this, this might be for uh, Peter. Um, I was looking at the projected uh, report from JFO, and it looks like 2021 is going to be rough, 2022 is going to be rougher, but it looks like 2023 is like things really look much more on the upswing. Is that accurate? And I'm just wondering if, you know, how to look at this process as opposed to a one-year process, maybe like a phasing process to sustain things for a while until we get to 2023. Is that, is that accurate? That's accurate and that's actually a good way of looking at it. Um, the, the projections that you have seen are all based upon uh, an e, our emergency board, which you, which you perhaps have heard, e-board approved uh, revenue forecasts and they met July something. I was watching, I can't remember the day. Um, but they, they approved this revenue forecast. The revenue forecasts are done by two economists, uh, Tom Cabet, our economist, and then the administration's economist. And they get together and do a uh, um, agreement. And uh, this is based upon that agreement. The, the, the variable here is what is the economy going to do? Um, you know, how much of a COVID boomerang will we have? Uh, how will that impact the economy? Uh, there are so many unknowns at this point in time. Your comment about uh, that I would paraphrase by saying, let's hang on and get through this and then, and then we can start, you know, poke our head above, above the ground and move, and move out from there. So um, hopefully I answered your question without too many words. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Kate, you're, you're, yep. pro, you're, uh, you're, there you go. Um, just wanted to let the folks know that um, I'd been in conversation with the, uh, with AVIC and with UVM and the state colleges regarding the request for legislation related to dealing with their uh, liability issues. Um, we've taken a look at that. I've spoken with a member of judiciary. Uh, for the most part, um, I included a meeting with, um, Representatives uh, Cooperly and Conlon, and we invited in also Representative um, 
Martin Lalonde, and the, the, the context just seemed to be more about legal liability than it was about education and felt a little bit beyond the scope of our, our committee. Um, we have, would have a steep learning curve and understanding things like willful misconduct and gross, gross negligence. Um, and so we, I, I am in conversation with um, a, the other Judiciary Committee to see if they would be willing to take that over rather than trying to bring that into our committee where the learning curve is just too steep. Um, so anything else? Tomorrow we will hear from, we will be doing a, a similar investigation, um, only this time the switch will be to pre-K-12. We'll be looking at the, uh, the Agency of Education budget. Um, also inviting in um, members from the group that we, we affectionately call the V's, who represent the educational associations, to uh, participate in that. I believe they are going to have some requests going forward. I believe the agency also has some requests for legislation going forward, so we will begin to have that conversation. But primarily, the, the most important thing that, that we can do right now is just be prepared um, to respond quickly to uh, the, the Appropriations Committee. Um, that's our primary reason for being back and everything else um, is secondary. Even really cool, great ideas. <laughs> so with that, I think there's an option that for the first mm -hmm. time, we will, we will end uh, early, unless there's anything else. Any other questions or thoughts going forward for this group? Uh, Kate, just a question about, um support for the state college's uh, budget request or non-support. Um, and this is probably better for Peter. You're not looking for a letter or memo from us right now that says, hey, we want you to move forward with this. We, we should just wait for you to come to us with a proposal. Yes, because right now I, I really don't have anything that, uh, that, that I can release. I'm working on something, um, but and until I get some agreements here, um, Better off to, to not. I have talked to your your chair, uh, but better off to not. And uh, uh, when I can come in with it, this is what we think we need to do. Then then we can go forward with that. Okay, thanks. Just bearing in mind at the moment, the recommendation is zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and the other thing is, we won't need a letter. Um, I can take back verbal. Uh, we're going to be very you know very quick here. We don't need to tie anything down with, with letters, or somebody can send an email. So it'll be very, very quick and, and, uh, and easy. So thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, then with that, um, we can go offline.